Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. You are the good, good Father. And God, we are privileged and honored to be your sons and daughters this morning. And God, as we are here in your presence, we now, Lord, open the seed of the Word of God the life-changing, life-rearranging Word. God, we ask that this morning you would speak into our lives. You would, you would change us by your Word. We invite you to change us this morning. We invite you to thrust us out into the harvest field. We invite you Lord, to speak into our lives. And so we fix our eyes on you this morning. God, we're in the room, so technically we're going to hear it. It's going to go by our ears. But God, we want to retain it. God, we want to do more than just let it go through our ears. God, we need to understand it so that we can then go out of those doors and do it. We don't want to be deceiving ourselves and being hearers only but we want to be doers of the Word. And God, we know that you promise that if we will do your Word, it will change us. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you agree, all God's people said amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Get your Bibles out or boot it up or whatever that is for you. Open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. And uh, you can also open up to 2 Corinthians 1. We're going to go there, and uh, I will catch up with you in a moment. I've been dealing on the heels of the series that we ended called Keep Your Eye on the Ball, which was dealing with a prophetic word uh, over this year. That prophetic word for us, which is an individual thing, is focus. Come on, say focus focus. Listen, because of the day and the time and the hour that we live, if we are going to, if you are going to survive as a Christian, then you and I are going to have to be able to keep our eyes on Jesus. Have you noticed there's a whole lot of other things to be distracted with? Amen. There is so much vying for our attention, so we have to have the grace of God individually to focus. And so then on the heels of that, we have transitioned into dealing with this this morning of refocus as a church because focus dealt with us individually. This refocus deals with us as a church. And occasionally what we have to do as a church is that we have to refocus. We have to remember why we are here. How many of you understand God put us here on purpose? Amen. God put us in downtown Elmira, on the east side of Elmira, on purpose. Amen. We have a divine purpose. We have a divine calling as a church. We are a unique church with a very divine, a very specific vision and calling. And so we've been dealing with that because, again, we, we talked about this because the natural order of things is for churches and ministries, if we are not deliberately keeping our eyes fixed, the natural order of, of things is to drift, to eventually, very subtly, very slowly get away from what we were called to do. This is how, as a church, we can end up in just being church as usual, just doing the church thing and, and forgetting what we were called to do. So we have to be deliberate about that. That's what this is about. That's what we've been dealing with over the last few weeks. And today, we continue to deal with our vision, our purpose. Turn on the back wall if you want to turn around. Look at that. We're going to read that again together. Our vision, our, our purpose, our order from this church is based in Luke 4.18. It's on the wall. That's not just a, a, a pretty saying. That's not just beautifully on the wall. That is why we are here. Let's read it together. Here we go. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, 
to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What we do as a church must further that vision. We were birthed in that vision. We were only like, what are we, 26 years old as a church, and we were birthed in that vision, and it is still, we've got to walk in and continue to fulfill that vision, that purpose. There's a, there's a lot of good things we could do, but new life's been called for that. Amen. So who he plants here and what we do here is for that reason, for that, for that purpose. And so we've dealt with that, the what. That's the what, remember. The timing is there, the when. Uh, now is the acceptable year of the Lord. It all hinges on that first line. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath, hath anointed me. Listen, anything that, that you and I are doing in the kingdom, it, if, it, if it is a kingdom purpose, then the anointing of God, which is the power of God, is required. Amen. Come on, amen. If you and I can do what we're doing without the anointing, then we are not really doing what we have been called to do. Come on, we've settled for something else. God's will, God's vision is always outside of us. It is outside of our abilities, outside of my experience, outside of my gifts and my skills and my talents. And the reason, again, is because in the end, all glory goes to God. Amen. So that you and I can't say, hey, look what I did. Amen. I'll tell you what, that'll get you in trouble with the Father right there. Hey, look what I did. I'm so good. I'm so talented. I'm so wonderful. Uh, listen, no, it's got to be, I don't know how that all turned out good. It is the anointing of Jesus Christ only. It is the power of God. He is the only one that could have done that. I mean, that right there is the definition of what it is to be humble. Every good thing I am, every th good thing I have done or will ever be or will ever do is only because of the Father. Amen. That is the definition of humble. And so, so it requires the anointing. Last week we dealt with the why. It is such an important question. You and I have to know why. Why do we do that? Why do we spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry? Why do we go out? Why do we do all of the things we do? If you were here last week, remember, here's why. Because heaven is real and hell is real. That's why. And there are people who are lost, and if they don't get found soon, man, I'll tell you what, sometimes as Christians, we can get so caught up in our Christian bubble, in our Christian world. Listen, we have to pay attention that there is a lost world right outside of us, outside of these doors, outside of our door at our house, uh, right, right there at work. There are lost people, and our Father so loved them that he sent his only begotten son that hopefully, that whosoever will, maybe one of those at work, maybe those, one of those in your neighborhood that would believe on him that they shall not what? Perish. Because of the possibility of people that we know and love perishing outside of Christ, you and I have to be aware that there is a why. Why do we do it? Because it would be so much easier to just, just do church like a hobby. Amen. A lot of people do church like a hobby. Just occasionally, whenever I feel like it, and as long as the sun ain't shining too bright, and it's not raining, and not windy, and not cold, and, and, and as long as my team ain't playing, and as long as I ain't got nothing else to do, then maybe I'll kind of go to church. Some, listen, it, it's not a hobby. Listen, this thing that God has called us to, it is our life. Amen. Because people need the Lord. People need to be saved. Listen, that's why we're not a social club, praise God. Amen. We're not a cruise ship for that reason. We're, 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 not just, we're just not in it for ourselves. God loves people. The gospel must be preached. Remember what that word means. Declared, told, and shown. Listen, today we're going to deal with this, our joy. It is going to kind of be a Sunday of illustrations. I love doing illustrations. Sometimes illustrations go good. How many of you have ever been here when an illustration went bad? How many, one time I, I knocked over the whole communion thing. Woo, baby. Man, that upset some folk right there. 
We had already taken communion, but one time I did a, uh, I have a family member who came to church here. They live, live out of state and they came to church like a decade ago and they still remember the sermon I preached that day because I preached on forgiveness and I had a mannequin. And I dragged that mannequin, it was tied to me, and I dragged that mannequin wherever I went, but the mannequin, about a quarter of the way in, began to fell, fall apart. And I'm walking around, all of a sudden there's an arm laying over there, and then a leg laying over there. I, I, I ended up just with a little piece of the torso. It went bad, but I'm going to tell you what, a decade later, they remember what I preached. Listen, the goal, the goal is that we understand, and we remember, and we go do. Praise God. And so we're going to do some illustrations this morning that, that, that if you've been around for a while, listen, we are refocusing. So some of these, I'll remember that because I want to put a picture in your head. I need to put a picture in your head. It helps us remember. So we're going to deal with the pile that is in front of us. And I jokingly said that, that, that my wife was preparing for a one-day trip, and, uh, and, and some of you right after church went to her and, and said, where are you going? No, 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 no. She's not preparing for, listen, we had food pantry this past week, and uh, I'll tell you what, this question, what's all the luggage for? Well, you're going to have to be at church and find out. So we're going to deal with the luggage this morning, because uh, it's not just a pile sitting here. Uh, this pile is, it, it, it represents that on the back wall. This represents our vision as a church. It represents our purpose. And these represent the ministries that God has birthed in this house to help fulfill that vision. That's what this pile represents. There are big ones, there are little ones, there are light ones, there are heavy ones. There's everything in between. These are the ministries that God has placed in this church to help fulfill the vision that he has called us to. So listen, as we step into this, let's just, as we talk about, about vision, there are three hurdles when it comes to purpose. Now, if you remember, we talked about purpose. Purpose is powerful. When you don't have purpose, it is very easy to slip into hopelessness. I don't have any reason to get up, man. You can slip right into depression. People, people without purpose... You give it a little bit, they're going to start walking in some trouble. Listen, a whole, a whole bunch of people sitting around with, with, with ain't, without any purpose, eventually somebody's going to come up with a good idea and it's going to be trouble. Because we don't have purpose and we don't know why we're here. Everybody, watch, everybody craves purpose. Everybody wants to know why, why was I born? And it certainly was for more than just paying my bills. Amen. Why was I born, God? God has a purpose for us. Everybody craves it, especially men. I just say, so. man, men without purpose is trouble. Watch, men without purpose easily slide into addiction. Men without purpose easily slide into depression. God has wired you and I for purpose, and not just any purpose, his purpose. His purpose, see, with purpose, it brings fulfillment and contentment and joy and hope. There's a reason to get up in the morning. Listen, his purpose brings that. Purpose is powerful. But there are three hurdles with it, and the first one is what knowing your purpose. A lot of people are right there, I don't even know what my purpose is. God will show your purpose. You are wired in a certain way. And that's the first hurdle, is knowing my purpose, the, the what and the why of my life. The second hurdle uh, has to do with our will. And, and, and as we deal with this, can I just say this? If you are still breathing, you still have purpose. When your purpose is done... You will be gone, and we will miss you. You're still here. Some of you are still breathing. That means, no, 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 listen, you don't understand the power of purpose. Listen, I grew up in the church, and when I left home, uh, I left home with the intention, I will never, ever, ever go back to church. 
Man, and I, I went, it worked out well for me, as you can see. Listen, I, listen, this is because I, was, listen, I went so far from Christ to do what I wanted to do and live how I wanted to live. And when I finally came to the end of myself, man, and, 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 and knowing that the Father in heaven would take me back, and somebody spoke to me, Jeremiah 29, 11, for uh, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. They are plans to give you a hope and a future. Listen, when I heard that, I, I was blown away that God still had a plan for my life. Because I thought I had messed it up. Surely, okay, I, I, listen, all right, God, God's going to forgive me, but I'll tell you what, he certainly doesn't have, because I messed up the whole purpose of my life. That's not true. If you're still breathing, God still has plans for you. It doesn't matter how much time you've wasted. It doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've gone. Listen, surrendering back to Jesus Christ, he's got purpose for your life. And it is divine purpose. Amen. Trust me, it will bring joy. It will bring fulfillment. It will bring contentment. It will bring hope into your life when you walk in purpose. It is powerful. It is powerful. That second hurdle is, is surrendering my will, understanding, say, saying yes to my God-given purpose. I exist for him and him alone. A lot, a lot of Christians don't know that. Because a lot of Christians got saved with the promise, give your life to Christ and all your problems will go. A lot of us weren't told that on the day we got saved, the day we got born again, I am no longer my own. I was bought with a price. I belong to him. Well, that's not a great sales pitch. But that's where joy is found. That's where purpose is found. That's where contentment is found is when we surrender. What does the word surrender mean? When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. The third hurdle is this, is, is, is more than just saying yes, it is the willingness to walk it out. Listen, it is not enough to know your purpose. It is not even enough to say yes to your purpose. You and I have to then begin to step up and step out into our purpose. That's the, that's the third hurdle. There, there is a walking out of our purpose. Our purpose. One of the wirings of our church is we are a servant-hearted church. We're not going to preach on that because I preached on that in, in, in January. But one of the things that we are is that we are a servant-hearted church. Let, let me help you. That requires stepping up and stepping out. That's not just something we say. Amen. We're, we're, oh, I'm a servant-hearted Christian. Well, okay, that requires something. There's an action required. So listen, as we deal with this, the rest of this this morning, I'm going to give you three um, more, there are a lot of threes this morning, three main points that I need you to remember. Here's the first one. There are three visions available. When you hear the word vision this morning, think purpose. That's what it is, vision from God. It is the purpose for our personal lives, for a church, our vision. There are three visions that are available. The first one is God's vision, God's purpose for your life. And that's what we're going to be talking about the rest of the time this morning. So here's number two, the second vision that is available. We have choices, church. God will not force you to do anything. He doesn't force us. He will not force you to get saved. He will not force you to walk in your purpose. He will not force you to serve. He will not force you to do anything. He, listen, he allows this thing that we, we can choose. And so there are, these visions are available. The second vision that is available is, is the vision of our own flesh. My sinful, selfish nature has a vision for my life. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of us in this room, we tried this. Listen, there's people in the room, you're trying this right now. What does that mean? I'm going to live for good old number one. And who is good old number one? Me. <laughs> See, it's been switched on us. Uh, our flesh has one thing in sight. Oh, be happy. 
Be happy. Just do whatever you got to do. Follow your heart. Follow whatever you want to follow. Just be happy. The goal in life is happy. The vision for our life is happy. To live for myself. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live how I want to live. Let me just read you two verses. They say the same thing. I'll just read one of them because it's exactly the same. Proverbs 14, 12 and Proverbs 16, 25. They both say this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. First-hand experience right here. I know what I want to do. I, uh, listen, I, I know who I want to be. I know, uh, I know what I want to do with my life. Listen, I wanna, I wanna, when I left church, still as a teenager, when, when I, le I left saying, I'm going to live my life my way. I am going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. I will drink what I want to drink. I will smoke what I want to smoke. I will have whatever relationships I want to have that I think will make me happy. I will, I will do whatever I want to do. And it didn't turn out well. How many of you have learned that? That don't turn out well. We have lived that verse. There is a way that seems right to a man. I know what I want to do. And we walk it and we go, man, this ain't turning out all that good. Let me tell you why. Because it's our way, not God's way. God's way, God's path, God's purpose for you, it will turn out well. Amen. And in the end, you will hear good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we all want to hear. It is found in the plan of God. Be happy. Just live. Listen, whatever it takes. A lot of us, we've wasted a whole lot of time trying to make other people happy. You see, how do people end up just, you know, oh, I'm just going to live for myself. Because some people have, have, have tried, watch, it is a full-time job to try and to make people in our life happy. How many of you, that's a full-time job and it will fail. Doesn't matter what you do, in the end, there's going to be something they're not happy with you about. And some people go, you know what, forget it. Then I'm just going to live for me and to make me happy. Now that sure seems logical, but that's that verse. I'm just going to make me happy. Man, I tell you what, I've had conversations with parents who are overwhelmed with regret because they bought the lie of culture that, listen, you just make everything about your children they are the kings and the queens and everything's about them and, 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 and pulled back from God and pulled back from church and, and it's just everything was kids and everything was sports and everything was, and then the kids left home and the parents are left with regret going, man, that was a mistake. Because I just lived to try and make them happy instead of living in the purpose of God. Listen, this was not my goal to be pastor. I, I've told you that before. This wasn't my goal. This was not my plan. This was not in my vision for my life. This was, this was not it. But, come on, say but. There's that word, but. It is in the plan of God that I found joy. It is in the plan of God that I found purpose. It is in the plan of God that I found fulfillment and contentment, doing the, not the thing that I intended to do, but I said yes to the king, and then I be, stepped up and stepped out into it, and it was there that I found joy. When we first started out, I was a, I was a youth pastor. And that was not my plan either. In fact, watch this, I was asked to go to youth group because the youth pastor needed help. There was a lot of kids. And so I said, all right, I'll go to youth group. Watch, that night, right on the spot, as soon as youth group started, the dude quit. <laughs> and there I stood. I'm here to help. You need, so what, you need somebody to pour the drinks? What? I and God called me out into it. Watch, watch what I found. Man, I found joy. Jennifer and I, we, got married. we found joy in serving those kids. 
We, we met some amazing kids. Some of you are still in this room. We met some amazing kids, kids who got saved, kids who are still walking with Christ today, living for God, kids that will be in heaven, that are joy. Amen. Man, I'll tell you what, I was busy. I was in, we, we, we ended up in college. I had two other jobs. We were busy. We had little kids. We had bills. And God gave us the joy of stepping out into something that was beyond us. And we said, all right, but God, we don't know how to do this. And he said, that's all right. I do. That's where, that's where joy is found. And so that is an option, our own flesh living for me. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's, that's an option that's available for the vision for your life. The third vision that's available is the enemy's vision. The enemy of your soul does have a vision for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. Let me tell you, his purpose is simple. You ready? Here's the purpose of the enemy's, uh, uh, his plan for your life. It's this, anything but... He don't care what it is, but just not the plan of God for your life. So you can fill your life with whatever you want to fill your life. Just don't walk in the purpose of God. Just live your life so, so filled and busy that you don't ever, you can't get around to the purpose of God. His plan for you is anything but the plan of God. Anything but. So watch this. God's purpose is people. We've been dealing with that. So he called us to be fishers of men. You're in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. Let's, let's just look at this real quick. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. And it says, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you, what? Fishers of men. That's purpose right there. That's vision right there. Now watch what they did because it's one thing to know vision. It's, an, it's another thing. And they're going to they're gonna say yes and step out like right now. Verse 20, they, what's the next word? Immediately. Watch, Jesus shows up. They're doing their thing, their life, and he says, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. Verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, verse 22, help me, and Immediately, they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. He says, I will make you fishers of men. I wanted to put canoes up here and, and deal with the fishers of men, but man, there was just too much going on on the platform. I would have probably fallen into the, into the canoes. But we have been called to be fishers of men. Watch this. Remember, this is what we've dealt with. He's called us to outward facing. We are all, listen to me, if you're a Christian... Part of the purpose of your life is that you are a fisher of men and women. You are a fisher, that, outward, individually, watch this. We are called, we are commanded, go tell people about Jesus. Why are you going to keep that to yourself? Because they might laugh at me. Well, praise you, Jesus. We are called to be fishers of men, but we are also called to be fishers of men together. But this represents this pile. These are, the, these are the things that we get to fish together in. Jesus immediately, he took his disciples there, he called them and said, follow me. And, and, and he, he didn't just say, oh, now just go live your life, do whatever you want to do. It, they began a, 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 a group fishing trip together. 
See, and that's what we get to do as the body of Christ. Yes, we do it individually, but we also are on a fishing trip together. And the reason is because together uh, we are stronger. Amen. Together we are better. Uh, together we are bigger. Together we cover more ground. Together uh, the reach is farther when we operate together. There are things we can walk in individually, but then there are things that we are called to walk in together and because we do it together, it would, it's way bigger and way further and touches more lives than we could ever do on our own. We are better together, church. Amen? It's the power of the body of Christ working together. This pile, they are things that we are called to do together. Let me say this. Being in a church with vision with outward vision requires that we carry our part. Be, let me, I'm going I'm to say it again because I don't know if we, listen, being in a church, listen, if we had no vision and it was just a hobby that you occasionally come and somebody's going to put on a show for you, if that was what it was, then there's nothing to carry. There's no, no spot. This is why, by the way, much of the body of Christ has turned into a spectator sport. And we just watch it occasionally, and we say amen. Listen, it's not a, listen this thing is not a spectator sport. Amen? You have been called for a purpose. We're all responsible for the purpose we've been called towards and to and wired for. But being a part of a church that has an outward vision, an outward focus requires that we carry our part. Watch, being outward focused is awesome. It's an amazing thing. Watch, being outward creates the, the, the outlets and the, the opportunities for you and I to be involved. Listen, because you can jump into one of these things and you can be, begin to, to go to work in the kingdom of God. Listen, you're going to have to roll your sleeves up and it's going to require some things and there's some cost to it of our time and our energy and all of that. Why? But you've got to keep in focus the why. Why do we do it? Why? Listen, if the why is big enough, then we do. And I don't know about you, but last week we, we settled the fact that the why is big enough. People need Jesus. Amen. People need Jesus. And so we step out into purpose. We step out and we carry our piece of the pile, our, 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 the plan of God that we've been called into. Watch this. This is the vision. This is the vision of new life. This cannot be carried by the pastor. And we all said, because <laughs> that was like a question, right? That, was, that wasn't a question. That was a statement. This vision cannot be carried by the pastor. We'll try it one more time. This vision, because, oh, you're the paid guy. I mean, you ain't doing nothing else. The paid guy, you can carry all of it. The vision from God cannot be carried by the pastor, we all said, Amen. or the faithful few. Come on. So many churches have the faithful few that do everything. That's not how it's supposed to work. It can't be carried. It can't be carried like that. There is a part for everyone that God calls into the kingdom. Listen, when God calls you into the kingdom, he's got purpose for your life. The plan of the enemy that we've been talking about deals, it deals with anything but that though. Watch this. The, 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 the vision that the enemy has for us, um, he will fill your arms. Hey, Don, come here for a second. He, just stand right there. He will fill our arms with anything and everything so that by the time we get to the pile, we can't. It is, it is we've talked about this before, the, the strategy called busy. Busy is not a medal that we wear. How are you? Busy. 
It is a strategy of the enemy to keep people out of their purpose. Busy. He, his, his goal is to load us up with anything and everything that, that, that we have, uh, that, that we can do. Anything but, come up with, anything but the, the plan of God. Any, anything, anything at all, uh, just, just whatever. These can be the good, this is good stuff. Good things, fun stuff. All sorts of cool stuff. So step right up here, Don. There's all sorts of things that, that, that he, he tells us he can put into our arms. So by the time we get to the pile, oh, I just, I can't. Put that in this hand, would you? Because then there's this thing. Watch, we live in a culture that is wired differently. I don't know if, 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 if you're older, if you know this yet, but we're in a different world right now. Ooh, baby. Watch. Everyone comes wired now with something that is very heavy and very busy, and it will fill. Look, listen. This thing is, it, it is fluid. This thing will fill every spare gap you have. If you, listen, listen. Say, I love you, Pastor. Because I'm about to talk about one of the loves of our life. Don't you talk about my phone. Listen, listen, these things, things of God, they can either be tools or traps. Listen, can I just ask you, get your phone out for a second if you've got a phone. And the amazing thing, almost everybody has a phone. And we can, you're good, you're good. That's your phone right there. <laughs> is that thing, be honest between you and the Holy Spirit, is that thing a tool or a trap? A trap. Is it a trap? Does it fill every waking day? Listen, if I got a moment's time, do I got to open it up? And listen, can I tell you the truth? This thing right here is like a, a part-time job. How many of you know Facebook is a part-time job? I got, to, I got to catch up. Man, I, I got to get, I'm behind. I got to catch up on, on everybody's status. I got to see what everybody had for dinner last night. I got to see how their bow movements went. I got to see what they're doing. I got to see, I got to check. I, I got to check their statuses. I got to check my status. I got to like their stuff and comment their stuff because if I don't like their stuff, they won't like my stuff. And then I'll look and nobody liked my stuff and then I'll feel bad about myself. And then I got to check with everybody. Am I still okay? Does everybody still love me? Am I still pretty? Am I still beautiful? Am I still, listen, this thing is a full-time job. Oh, yeah. I got to catch up. I am behind on Facebook <laughs> or whatever. Every, every, every spare moment, well, I got 30 seconds in the grocery line. Boom. I'll play a game for a moment because maybe I can conquer that next level on Candy Crush before I get up there. <laughs> Can I tell you, can, watch, let me help you. If God's purpose is people, and we live like this, people are there. I'm not against it, tool or trap, that's all I'm saying. You need to ask the Holy Spirit of God, is this stuff a tool or is it a trap? Uh, you know, listen, if you don't know what these are, then praise you Jesus, you don't know what they are. But if you know what they are, you know right now, the Spirit of God, well, is that a tool or a trap for your life? One of the, th listen, and if it's a trap, listen, then you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to self-impose some boundaries. Amen. amen. Come on, front, just say amen for me, Jennifer. Amen. amen. Somebody got to say amen. We got to self-impose some boundaries. And we all said we all said, I know it's true, I just don't like it. Mom and dad, you need to self, you, not, listen, you need to impose some boundaries on your kids Amen. with this stuff right here. You can put it, you, no, 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 let me just, listen, what this was about, see, he fills us with everything, so when we get to the pile, I can't, because I'm so busy, I, I'm just so busy. I don't know where all my time goes. I'm just so busy. <laughs> Come on, say, I love you. I love you, Pastor. It's all right. <laughs> Ooh, there's a lot less people that time. Say, it's all right, Pastor. I'm still coming back next week. You, you can put it down for a second. Don, just, just put that right there. Just, just, yep, just stick it there. 
This thing, this thing, is it a tool or a trap? Three visions are available. There's God's vision, there's my own sinful, selfish nature's vision, and there's the enemy's vision. And you and I get to choose. Listen, it is still humbling. You can just put it all down. Just put it down, go have a seat, relax, kick your feet up, whatever you like to do. It is still, yeah, don't get on your phone. Don't get on the phone. Listen, I, I probably told this story before. It just came to my head. Uh, I, that uh, uh, one time I had, this was a while back. How many of you remember Farmville, the game? Watch. I had somebody who was, who was always at prayer meeting call me one Wednesday night and say, Pastor, I can't be there tonight. I'm busy. I said, man, what's going on? Man, they're like trying to hedge around. Oh, well, you know, uh, I just, uh, I got crops coming in. <laughs> Watch, I didn't even know what Farmville was. And I said, what? I didn't even know you were into gardening. Oh, I'm not really into gardening. It's Farmville. And my crops are coming in. And so I can't. Now listen, that is an extreme thing that we all say, oh my goodness, I would never. But listen, if that thing is a trap, watch. I'll tell you the truth. Here's how you know if it's a trap. If you feel so busy that you can't walk in the purpose of God for your life, that thing's a trap. Praise you, Jesus. It's kind of how, it's kind of how that, that where it is still humbling and mind-blowing and life-changing to realize that the creator of the universe has a plan and we get to be part of it. Amen. I gotta just say, it is an honor to go fishing with you. It is an honor to be on a fishing trip together. People who understand we're not just spectators, we got a purpose. And then step up and step out and go, yeah, let me carry my part. Every season of life is different about what we can carry. We got to be hearing from God about what our part is. He's the one that gives vision. The second point that I need us to remember, I spent a lot of time on the first one. We're going to move quick through this. And I need to, I need to, how many of you were here last Sunday? I need a few, a few of the leadership that helped me last Sunday or anybody in the quick circle right here. If anybody helped me last week, I just need a few people to make the circle. Hey, yeah, I need Jesus to come again. Uh, uh, just make that quick circle. If you weren't here last week, Jesus put that on so we know that's you. And uh, if you weren't here last week, make a circle, make a circle, make a circle. Three of you facing in, everybody else facing out. Remember, this is a picture of our church. It is a picture. Hey, George, come here. This is a picture of our church. I told you there's going to be illustrations today. Listen, this bag, this was too fancy to put in the pile, and it looks good with George anyway. Right there, so watch. If you remember, we are an outward-facing church. Now, some of the ministries are facing inward because when God brings us across, because we are outward, uh, then, then we bring the gospel to the poor, healing to the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, liberty to them to the, that are bruised. There are people in our lives, because we are outward facing as a church, that we get to reach out. And if you were here last week, what do we do with them? We don't bring them to ourselves or our programs, right? We take them and we do what with them? We bring them to Jesus. We bring them to Jesus. Doc, let me have you step over here, Doc, and let me have you step here because I want you to see what happens in there with Jesus because Jesus is, in, is the healer. Now, that bag was too fancy for vision. That bag is simply baggage, and we all have baggage. Come on, let's just all be real together. How many of y'all got some baggage in your life? We'll wait for the rest of you. We have baggage, and we come with it. All of us come with hurt and pain and wounds of, of, of maybe what other people have done to us. And maybe it's things from our own decisions. I'll tell you what, I had a whole lot of baggage that was in my life that it wasn't other people, it was me. Watch this. Jesus is the healer. We introduce them to Jesus. We bring them to Jesus because Jesus 
unpacks baggage. And Jesus will unpack your baggage. He will heal your baggage. He will deliver us. He will set us free. Watch. And then what, what happens is that then he heals us and then God then sends us out. Right? We don't exist just hanging out on the inside. Thank you all. You can sit. I just needed us to have a visual reminder of that last week. God is the one who heals and unpacks your baggage. He's the one that will heal the pain of our life, the things that we have been through. He's the one that heals it. Man, that is good news. There is a God that can heal your baggage. There's a God that can unpack it, can put it into order. All of the regret from our past, the shame and the guilt and the condemnation, Jesus will unpack it and say, this doesn't belong to you anymore. I paid for this on the cross. This, this hurt, this wound, this thing, this, this is not yours anymore. I, I've come to heal you and deliver you and set you free. I've come to heal your bruises. I've come to heal your broken heart. That's what happens when we bring people to Jesus and don't bring them to ourselves. Listen, we don't give a rip if anybody remembers us. We want them to see Jesus. Amen. Come on, he's the healer. He's the healer. Why does he do that? Why does he do, do in the center of that? Why does he do? Watch, he does it for your good. He will heal you for your good because he loves you. You're his kid. He does not see, want to see you live under regret and shame and guilt and condemnation and the pain and the wounds of your past. He does not want you to have to live under that. So he will heal you for your good. But, come on, say but. He will also heal you for other people. He heals you because he loves you and he heals you because he loves them. See, God is a people person. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 to 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort that, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Watch this. The very thing that he healed in your life, he will then put you as an outward-facing part, and he will help you bring healing to people because you recognize their baggage. I, I used to have a bag just like that. Can I tell you there's a healer for that? Now, I may not be all the way there yet. I may not be perfect yet, but I know the healer. Amen. I, I know who he is, and I can introduce you to the healer. He does it for your good. He does it for their good. And then watch this. He does it for his glory. He does it for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God made you to bring glory to his name. You know what that means? That means you're not a fluke. The enemy will tell you, listen, the rest of these people are spiritual. I don't know how you got in here, but they don't really know what you're like and what you've done. That's the lie of the enemy. You are not a fluke. He chose you on purpose. Listen, he knows everything you've done. Woo, think about that for a moment. Our wounds affect what we can carry. I got a sliver this week. I, mean, I hate slivers. I put my hand under this thing and boom. This sliver, it was like 17 inches long. No, no, not really. I mean, it was like this big. And it was sticking out of the pad of my finger. And I was like, oh, I hate that. And so I grabbed it and I pulled it, but it broke. Oh, you, so, see, you know, my, you know the pain right there, don't you? Right on the pad of my finger. 
my wounds affect what I can carry. And when I just live wounded, it will affect what I can carry related to the purposes of God. Let me, let me say it this way. Victims can't go. Remember, we're called to go. Go and make disciples of all. Victims can't go. Victims can't carry because they got enough problems of their own. Listen, listen to me. You don't have to be a victim. You may have been victimized. But in Christ, come on, say in Christ. You don't have to live as a victim the rest of your life. Because he unpacks baggage. And he heals anything we bring to him doesn't mean we will completely forget it. It means he will heal us. But if we choose to stay a victim, and some people do. Listen, God, again, won't force you to do anything. If we choose to stay a victim forever, watch, we will always have more than we can handle, and we can never walk in God's plan. Why? Because we just got all this stuff. You can choose to stay a victim. Come on. Three-letter word that changes everything, but that's not God's plan. Watch this. God's plan involves you healed up from what someone else did to you. God's plan, what? God's plan is not to minimize that. God's plan is to say, I see the wound that they did to you, and you're mine, and I want you healed for your good, for other people's good, and for my glory. But we got to be willing to, to allow him to be healed and not just have to carry that around. I'm just, I, you, you don't have to be the victim forever. You can be healed in Jesus Christ, no longer the victim, but the victor in and through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Like I said, we may not be all the way there yet. Maybe we're in the process. Praise you, Jesus. There's a process. But he's healing us. We are on our way. And as long as you're on your way, how awesome would it be to help someone else who's back there and you recognize their baggage? Watch. You can't take... You can't take all the stuff to heaven. How many of you know that? All the stuff that we work so hard to get, when you die, it goes to someone else. And maybe it will go to someone you don't even like. That's a kicker right there, isn't it? How are they going to get the stuff I worked so hard for? Listen, the only thing you can take to heaven is people. People that you led to Christ. People that you shared and showed the gospel to. People that you will see in heaven. So as long as you're on your way, why not take some folk with you? I'm going to have to end here. I can't do number three till next time, but I'm going to have to end. Uh, listen, this is why, let me end with this. This is why this pile is not a burden, this pile is our joy. Listen, we don't have to, we get to go out into the harvest field together. We get to spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry. We get to, listen, those of you who are, who are in our kids' church, look at me real quick. 
Because sometimes it's like, man, I don't know if I'm doing any good. Listen, we get to, you get to sow the seed of the word of God into a little kid's life. Maybe they'll grow up and you never see them again, but one of these days, man, you may be in heaven and they come up to you. I'll tell you the truth. There are some teenagers that we minister to. We've never seen them again, but we know of them and we know they're walking with Christ. And one of the, when we end up in heaven, there will be teenagers that come up to us. Whew, and we will not say this is our burden. We will say that was our joy. Oh my goodness, we were, we were busy and it was more than, man, it was so much and it was like, man, this, this is tiring. I love teenagers, but man, I'll tell you what, <laughs> they can be tiring, but we loved every minute of it. This is our joy. This is not burden. The vision of God and the purpose of God for your life is not a burden. That is a lie from the enemy. See, that's how he can convince. You ain't got time for any of that. Look at your, look at your arms. You're, you're so full with, you ain't got time for the purpose of God. What a burden. This, this pile is not burden. This pile is joy. Doesn't mean that it doesn't get tiring. Because it does. But it is our joy. This pile is not our duty, it is our privilege, it is our honor. Let me have you stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to have to end there. We'll pick back up uh, next, time, next time I preach. Listen, it is not our duty. Luke 4.18 and all of the ministries associated, they are not our duty. They are our privilege and our honor, our joy. It is these outlets and these opportunities that we get to go fishing together. We get to spend ourselves, and yes, we do. It sp we spend ourselves, it costs money. It costs time, it costs energy, it costs all sorts of things. But if the why is big enough, watch this, then the children of God willingly spend themselves on behalf of the hungry. Because we love God, because we are His. Listen to me church, He's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. Next time, next time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with the last piece of, of this that I didn't get to deal with today and then move on into the next part of this. It, but, but listen, he's got a plan for your life. You got to know what you were created for. You got to say yes, but then you're gonna, you got to step up and step out. Can I tell you, church, this pile does not get carried again by the pastor and just the faithful few. This pile, if we're going to be a part of an outward-facing church, it requires us to be able to carry our part. Can I encourage you? Can I challenge you this morning? Yes, there is vision and purpose for our personal lives that we are to walk out, but then we are called into a church. Some big, some, some little parts, what, whatever it would be. God, what's my part? Because you didn't put me here to watch. You didn't call me into the kingdom. You didn't unpack my baggage for me to just watch. You unpacked my baggage and you've started the process of healing me. And then you say, now go. You go. You tell other people, you show other people, you serve other people, you bring the gospel to them. Tell them there is a way to get those bags unpacked. Tell them there is a God that loves them. Boy, church, is to go into the harvest field together and as co-laborers, the Bible says, with Christ. I'll tell you the truth, purpose is Powerful.
Just close your eyes and just get alone with God for a second. We're going to pray. And we're going to sing in just a second this old song that just says, Have thine own way. I tell you what, and that's going to be, that's a prayer that we, we're just going to speak to the king. God, have your own way. But listen, listen. This morning, if you are in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ, I mean, you know of him, maybe you even believe there is a God, but if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible calls it being born again, it is a moment of decision that, that, that says, God, I put my faith in you. Come and live inside of me and forgive me of my sins. If you have never done that this morning, in just a moment, we're going to pray together. If that's you, if you don't have a right relationship with God, or maybe you're in this place and you, you prayed that sometime in your past, but maybe somehow, some way, you find yourself what the Bible refers to as a backslider. This is what I was. I knew him, but I, I slowly and subtly just kind of shifted away from him. And I found myself not in a right relationship with Christ. Listen, your Father in heaven will take you right back and he will forgive you of all of your sin. And he will restore you right back into the plan of God. I am standing here as proof. Listen, if you're in this church this morning and you would say, yes, Lord, to your plan. God, I, what, what, watch, here's the answer. Yes, Lord. Someone say, well, what's the question? It doesn't matter. If you're his, then the answer is just y yes, Lord. Come on, if that's you this morning, just put your hands up. I'm going to pray for you right there where you're at. If you're just saying this morning, maybe again, maybe for the first time, saying, just saying, yes, Lord. God, I say yes to your vision for my life. I say yes to your plan over my life. Come on, just between you and him, say, just tell him. Say yes. You can say it out of your mouth. God, I say yes. I don't even know what it is yet, God, but I say yes to you. I say yes, yes to your plan. I say no to the enemy's plan for sure. And I say no to even my own flesh's plan. God, I want to live in your plan. I don't want to waste this life and this time. God, I want to live in your plan. So I say yes. Oh, you want to do something crazy here before we end? Watch this. Get your phone. Where's my phone? Where, let me, let me have this. Get your phone out. Have you ever surrendered your phone to Christ? Or any of those electronic things that we've talked about? These things that can be a tool or a trap. Hold your phone right in your hand. If you're, if you're, if you're willing to say, God, this thing, I surrender to you. To be a tool, not a trap. If that, if that, just hold your phone right out. If you, if you don't have a phone, just kind of put your hands out like you're holding something because maybe it represents uh, other things that are in the shape of rectangles that the enemy always seems to use, like money or television or whatever it might be. He like loves that shape. I don't know what it is, but hold it right out and say, God, I surrender this to you. To be a tool and not a trap. I break in Jesus' name the authority that I have given for this thing to be a trap. And I submit it to you, Jesus Christ. I surrender it to you, Jesus Christ. Father, we stand here as people who want to be used in the kingdom of God, who would say yes to your plan. So we say, have your own way. Listen, this morning, if you don't have a right relationship,